to receive you and that, God, we may be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. We glorify you and we bless you, for it is in Jesus' name we do pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Let us be seated. Praise the living God. Today I want to take this opportunity to thank our Reverend Omondi for giving me this opportunity to be able to share the word of God with you. I also want to thank the Lord for this beautiful day that he has given us that we may be able to hear his voice. For those who are new, there could be those who are new who are not willing to stand. I'm called Susan Ochieng, and there are those who also know me as a Sioux baby. So if you hear that, know it is still the same person. My theme today is whom are you worshiping? And my text is coming from the readings that we had today, but I'll concentrate on 1 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 1 to 10. I want to thank the readers for reading so well, and may the Lord continue to bless you. I also want to thank the worship team for giving us a chance that we may be able to praise the Most High God. I'm not going to go through the reading once again, but I just want to, as an introduction, as I was going through uh, the readings, I remembered my late maternal grandfather who was born again and he taught me the word of God at a very tender age. And granny taught me hymns and granny taught me carols. And therefore I always, when I sing the hymns, I remember my granny for teaching me the word of God. My granny was also a lay reader in those years, and I also thank God that through him, I have also been a lay reader. My paternal grandfather, I didn't see him. I didn't have the privilege of seeing him. My parents were not married then, but I hear that he too was a lay reader, and he was also a church treasurer. And I thank God that in my heritage, I have had a godly heritage. But that does not make me a godly person. I just have that heritage. And I'm bringing this in the context of what the Israelites were going through. Um, godliness is not an option in the development of a contagious character. But godliness is, res is not reserved for a few Christians but it is for all of us. The privilege and duty of every Christian is to pursue godliness, to study godliness, and to practice godliness. But what does it mean to be godly? Does it mean we can't watch the TV? Can a person be godly and yet competitive in business and active financial success? The answer is yes. But at the same time, we may have a person who is talented and is involved in God's work and even is successful and also does some Christian service and is also not godly. So what does godliness mean? Godliness is taking God's Taking God seriously, it is the heartbeat of each one of us who is godly, who desires to be a godly person, and it means to respect and have reverence for God or the things of God. They enjoy life because they enjoy the creator of life. In the Old Testament, we are given an account of people who failed to take God seriously. And we can see like what Hebrew is uh, telling us, I mean what the, uh, the Hebrews were doing 
from what Paul was writing for us in 1 Corinthians 10, from verse 1. I'll read. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. During the journey of the Israelites to Canaan, they had a number of uh, miracles that they saw. They saw the Lord parting the Red Sea. And they saw their Egyptian, the Egyptians being brought to doom. God guided them with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God delivered them through the Red Sea. God provided for them food from manna, and they, God gave them water from a rock. They were surrounded by many privileges. God's presence was constantly with them. His workings were very evident, and they had been given a heritage of godliness. With all this, God dividing the sea that they may be able to pass through, God giving them manna, God giving them water from a rock, we would assume that these people would really worship the most high God. But that was not the case. God was not pleased with them because they were not worshiping God during this time. Some of them decided to do their own things. And in that they were destroyed. What happened to these potential saints? What caused their demise? Paul again says that they became idolaters. They decided that they would hear the word of God, they would see what God has done for them, but they would still not worship the most high God. They forgot where they came from. They forgot their heritage. They did not mean business with God. And their relationship with God became a face. Never in the history of the world have we seen a nation that has been blessed like the people of Israel. Today, we have our churches we have the Christian TVs and radios. We have the Christian magazines and books. We have Christian conferences and seminars. But are we godly? Is our church overflowing with godly men and women? Are they there? Are we walking in the way of Christ? We make light of what we should honor. And the things that we need to take seriously, we do not take seriously. We do not take our God seriously. If each one of us would have a reflection of what God has done in our lives, the times that the Lord has saved you from accidents, the times that the Lord has healed you. The times that the Lord has comforted you. The times that you lost your job and he was still able to provide for you. Do we remember these things? Or when the things are over, we forget. We forget the most high God. But if we are taking this thing seriously, then we are on our way to godliness. How do you know you are godly? How do you know you're taking God seriously? 
people who take God seriously, number one, thirst for God. If we want to be godly, we must long for God. David said in Psalm 42, as we sing, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. If we want to take our God seriously, we will need to thirst for God. The psalmist wanted to see the face of God by entering into his fellowship and presence. As you are thirsting for God, you will desire to enter his fellowship and also his presence. Haman Cain the columnist writes, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or else it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up. It knows it must run the, it must run the swiftest, the, the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. So Cain says this, it doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you must be better running. We must thirst for God. Charles Pagan, a British uh, palpita, also writes, if you are not seeking the Lord, the devil is seeking you. If you are not seeking the Lord, judgment is at your heels. Godliness does not come by sitting comfortably and expecting it to be on your lap. It requires hard work, enduring perseverance, and a continued effort. We must always be on the run. You have to run for it and everything you got. The godly person is, is not content in their relationship with God, but must also be, must never be satisfied with the present experience. They must always yearn for more. Number two is to focus on God. The pursuer of godliness focuses his attention of, on, of God at all times we tend to divert our attention to God and more so when we are in trouble. If one has a child who is unwell and you're probably you have been told the child cannot be cured, many times we do not run to God. Many times we'll be told by friends, let me take you to this magician. Let me take you to this preacher. Let me take you to this and this place. And many times, those places are not where the most high God is worshipped. We listen to many things that do not help us. We run to places that do not give us a breakthrough. We need to know who God is. We need to worship God. Yes, the times may be tough, but let us put our focus on the creator of heaven and earth. Paul says that we have idolaters. We will worship other things other than God. If you worship anything that puts God against you, it means that you are worshiping something that is not godly. <coughs> he also says, uh, Paul also says that money is another thing that also separates us from the love of God. And more so when we love money so much 
that we do not think about God. We need to put our focus on God. We need to open our ears that we may hear the soft spoken word of God. Let us not hear things that are not right. Let us worship God. Worship enables us to prophesy and acknowledge God. We see him as the majestic and sovereign, and we see ourselves as infinite and helpless. The godly person removes himself from the center of his world and puts God in his proper place. The reverence of God will help us to worship God rightly. More often than not, we take our God very lightly. We approach him in a very casual fashion. But we are to approach God with respect and reverence. Reverence of God will also regulate our conduct. What or whom we worship determines our behavior. If we worship football or we worship uh, basketball or any other game, our conduct and our behavior will be consumed by the sport. But if we worship money, then we are also driven to accumulate as much as possible. But if a person seeks God, they seek to know him and live obediently to his principles. Finally, we need to serve other people. The godly person does not complain about what is happening to them. Instead, they find joy in service. And the quickest way to dwell is not to dwell on personal misfortune, but is to get involved with those who are least, less, uh, less fortunate than we are. And by doing so, we will discover that we are better off than most people. The, the godly individual not only gives God his due, he also serves his fellow men and gives him his due. As we invest time to God, he will guide us and also to help us serve others. Godly people know the service is all about growth, of, uh, to, is an outgrowth of worship. So my question is, whom are you serving? Whom are you serving? And as I conclude, we need to worship God. We need to worship him with respect and awe. We need to speak of the word of God. And as we come to the conclusion, I would ask, is there anybody willing to live a life of godliness? A life that will change you from being in the world and worshiping the most high God. It is a time to surrender our life to God. It is a time to surrender and to know whom we want to worship. If there's anybody who wants to give his life to Christ, I will ask them to stand. And as we sing hymn number 117, a shelter in the time of storm. When we are in the storm, many times we forget who the most high God is. But at this particular time, I want us to know that we have a place that we are shielded. The Lord's a rock in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Thank you, our water. 
a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, oh Jesus is the rock in a you are our rock. We thank you that you are our shade by day and a defense by night. We thank you that you are our shelter in the time of storm. When the raging storms may round us beat, you are a shelter. You are our rock divine and our refuge dear. Father, how we pray that master May we worship you with respect and reverence. May we not take you casually, O oh God, but that, Father, we may surrender our life to you. That, Father, you may get into our hearts and that we may be subdued and be able to confess that you are our Lord and Master. Father, we thank you and we honor you and we bless your glorious name because you are the sovereign Lord. For it is in Jesus' name we do pray and we do. Amen. The Lord's our rock in him. 